you're a director. Here's two faces. Think about how you could compose them on screen for a dramatic conversation between a couple. You might have them sit across from each other and use over the shoulder shots. You could have them walk beside each other. You could have them stand arguing, or you could play it in profile. There are a lot of great ways you could frame the couple, but would you come up with this? What a tall home for you, dear. The face is perhaps one of the most important and powerful dramatic tools cinema has at its disposal. In the hands of a talented performer, the drama of a face can be one of the most captivating parts of a film. And yet when it comes to how faces are presented in film, the way they're composed and arranged on screen, it can be easy to fall into a rut, relying on convention to compose them in tried and true ways that we've all seen thousands of times. Maybe the greatest exception to this, the director I would consider the master of composing faces in unique and inventive ways, is Swedish director Ingmar Bergman. Thank you to Mubi for sponsoring this video. Förr såg du rakt fram, öppet, utan att maskera dig. Bergman's filmography is piercingly intimate. His stories often have little or no action, take place in a few simple locations, and involve just a handful of characters. A few people having a conversation is maybe the most well-tread territory in film, yet his films are often visually striking and contain inventive imagery that I've never seen anywhere else. Like many directors, he spins faces so we see them straight on in direct profile or facing away from the lens. While these types of compositions aren't unusual in other films, what sets Bergman apart is that he's not afraid of playing even his most important dramatic moments on a composition like this. And he isn't afraid to linger here for an extended period of time. But more unusually, he also rotates faces, turning them sideways and even completely upside down. Beyond changing the position of a face, you can modify its shape further by obscuring part of it with an object in the foreground. Light also plays an important role in shaping the face. How a face is lit dramatically changes its texture. Light can make a face foreboding or flat. With it, you can even reduce a face to a sliver. The lighting doesn't have to be static either. In Persona, Bergman illustrates a shift in internal emotion by subtly changing the light on a face. In Summer with Monica, he does something similar, but this time he changes the light that surrounds the face instead of the light on the face. I think the two places he does this in this film are its most striking moments. Using lines cast by shadows, you can divide a face into pieces, further creating unique compositions and shapes. In Persona and the Seventh Seal, costume design is used to emphasize the faces of certain characters. In these examples, it almost disembodies the face, in one case emphasizing the character's true nature as a spirit, and in the other calling into question whether the character is truly real or just a psychological projection. In Cries and Whispers, two sisters' faces are shrouded in black, contrasting the third sister's face surrounded by white. The drama of the face can be very subtle. Appreciate just for a moment the emotional detail in the small expressions on Liv Ullman's face in this scene, and our ability to extrapolate internal conflict just from what we see on her face. And you can tell Bergman really trusted the power of a face on its own. In this scene from Cries and Whispers, he creates horrifying tension simply by keeping the scene in close-up. It creates a feeling that something terrible is being kept just out of view. Those are a lot of variables that give you a lot of options for uniquely portraying a single face, but where the potential of faces becomes truly infinite is in the arrangement of multiple faces in a frame. The interplay between two faces in a frame can create an incredible variety of compositions. You can visually contrast desire and indifference, or concern and ecstatic bliss within a single composition. In The Seventh Seal, which features a fairly large cast for Bergman, he stacks faces on top of each other, arranging them in tableau. Here he uses faces in symbolically significant ways. In this scene, the face of a mask represents death's presence looming over the party. 
He does a similar thing in The Winter Light, a film about a priest struggling with doubt. Here the face of Christ looms in the background, as if he's just another face in one of Bergman's compositions. And in this scene from The Seventh Seal, the two characters in the foreground act as mouthpieces for the words of the characters behind them. Those characters' faces sit on the shoulders of the speaking characters, like angels and devils. Light again plays a role with multiple faces. Now Bergman can contrast how two faces are lit. One can be dark and one can be light. One can be evenly lit and another split by shadow. Bergman also understands intuitively the power of obscuring a face. As humans, we're drawn to see faces. Our brains are highly attuned to recognize faces and the emotions displayed there. So we're acutely aware of the presence of a face that we can't fully see, feeling almost cheated of the emotional information that's just out of sight. And Bergman plays with this constantly, cutting faces off, letting us see only a small piece or obscuring them altogether. Giving us only a small piece of a face makes us pay closer attention to try to make out what information we can, and it can also represent a character's attempt or desire to hide what they truly feel. In Bergman's exploration of the face, it's important to note his collaboration with cinematographer Sven Nyquist. Sven's stunning minimalist black and white cinematography would help emphasize the landscape of the face. Bergman utilized faces in interesting ways before working with Sven, but together they would push the boundaries of what was possible even further. Their collaboration started with The Virgin Spring, developed over several films, and perhaps reached its peak with Persona. Bergman is the master of using the face in unique ways in cinema, Persona is perhaps the film that pushes his use of the face to its limit. It's hard to think of a film more thematically oriented around the landscape of the face than Persona. The idea of the face itself and the portrayal of faces on screen is intimately linked to the themes of the film. Not only is Bergman exploring the edges of how a face can be abstracted on screen and composition without losing the emotional information that resides there, he's utilizing the face and the interplay between two faces to create powerful symbolism at the core of the film. So why isn't this kind of composition and experimentation with faces more common in film? Well, to achieve what Bergman's achieving, it's not just about composition. The emphasis on face runs much deeper into production. How scenes are staged and how actors work is affected. What's often missing from Bergman's cinema is shot and reverse shot. Because we often see close-ups and reactions in the same frame, there's an added complexity not just for individual compositions, but in the progression from one composition to another within single shots. Actors have to move their heads and reposition themselves at precise moments. For some of these moments, Bergman is blocking scenes not just on the scale of where actors stand, but on the scale of the turn of a head. In this scene from Cries and Whispers, as two sisters try to reunite, as they push away from each other, they face away from us, concealing themselves from us and one another. But as they open up to each other, they turn their faces towards us, literally becoming more emotionally open to the audience as they open up to each other. Working like this is a lot to ask of your talent, especially when you're dealing with material that's as emotionally raw as Bergman was. And without shot and reverse shot, there aren't many options here to adjust things in the edit. And that might have been part of why the director tended to stick with certain actors once he'd found ones he liked working with. Most contemporary dramas are much more geared towards giving actors flexibility and freedom. The recent film Malcolm and Marie has a lot of elements that are evocative of a Bergman film. It's shot in black and white, it has one location, only two characters, and deals with interpersonal conflict. There are even some moments that seem to evoke Bergman's use of faces. 
but because the actors are moving more freely, the shapes and compositions they create with their faces are much more fleeting and fluid. In Bergman's films, it's the holding of these positions or the precision of the movements, as much as it is their presence, that gives them a lasting impact. Working this way, using the face as a landscape isn't right for every film, story, style of performance or cinematography. Packing two faces close together works well for certain kinds of scenes and subject matter, but would be terrible for others. My hope in highlighting how Bergman uses faces is not just to inspire you by showing you what's possible with a face, but also to showcase just how limitless any individual aspect of film can be and how much potential lies just outside the boundaries of convention. In this video, I've been illustrating Bergman's approach to using faces, one I think is incredible. But one of the things I love about film is that just because one approach works well and produces interesting results on screen doesn't invalidate other, sometimes opposite approaches. A filmmaker who works much less formally, giving his actors a lot of freedom to improvise but who still finds interesting compositions in the process is Derek C. in France. His film Blue Valentine is made using techniques dramatically different from how Bergman approached filmmaking, and yet he reaches a similar level of dramatic effect. You can watch Blue Valentine right now on Mubi, my sponsor for this episode. I can recommend Blue Valentine or other films for you to watch on Mubi, but what I love most about Mubi is that it's a hand-curated streaming service. On many other platforms, the films that are recommended to you are shown to you because an algorithm thinks you'll like it. This can be great for finding more stuff like films you've already watched, but it's not a great way to find something new. On Mubi, every film is handpicked by their team, and they even provide an explanation for why they think the film is worth checking out. You can explore their library and the new film they add every day for free when you sign up for an extended free trial at Mubi.com slash Thomas Flight. That's Mubi.com slash Thomas Flight to sign up for your extended free trial.